welcome back to the Chris Buskirk Show. I am joined today by Malcolm Shayuna, uh, who is a writer, and I am informed uh, today that he is also a non-denominational populist living in Sweden, as well as Angela Nagel. She's the author of the book Kill All Normies, as well as a number of interesting um, essays in places like American Affairs, Unheard, and uh, Angela, as we were just saying, you started off writing for Jacobin, but uh, there's... Uh, it's probably unlikely that uh, we'll see your byline there anytime uh, soon, yeah. which is, which is sort of a, well, well, it's actually, that's a kind of a good segue right into what we uh, want to talk about. I should, I should also add that both of you are regular collaborators on the what's left podcast with Amy Therese and with Oliver Bateman. Um, but uh, Malcolm, both you and Angela um, sort of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sort of grew up on the political left but then were uh were kicked out uh maybe i don't know if they left you left them or they left you but uh there was a split uh that occurred angela you started writing at jacobin but that um maybe it's a, maybe it's useful to sort of frame this conversation which is picking up where malcolm and i left off a month or two ago about um it's almost like the title of the of the your other podcast what's left but how does the left identify itself how does it think about itself what and what is it doing um and then there came a point i guess angela where um what uh what the jacobin left was doing and what you uh were doing uh parted company how, how to maybe explain what happened there just as a way of framing our bigger picture discussion Mm. Well, I think the official parting company was um, an American affairs piece um, called The Left Case Against Open Borders, um, which I kind of took a gamble on in the hope that some people would um, see the sense in what I was saying and that some people hadn't gone for me just beyond a point where I could possibly, you know, agree with them or hadn't gone fully kind of anarchist, um, which is a trend that I saw kind of throughout the, the Bernie years, we'll say. Um, but it was clear from the reaction, which was 100% negative, um, uh, that this was now something you had to believe. So you basically couldn't, couldn't believe in it, the nation state having any legitimacy whatsoever anymore. Um, and you so see, yeah, that, that kind of, anar that move towards anarchist had, had really fully taken place by then. Um, and that the, the, the very extreme response to the piece sort of made that just impossible to ignore. And it was also the moment where I realized that, um, any hopes that I had had for the Bernie project, you know, it, which did have signs of hope at the beginning, in my opinion, um, were, were over. I mean, at that point, I had to say, this thing has been completely, at this point, taken over um, by uh, the, uh, Malcolm and I have talked about it elsewhere, the, this kind of, um, the, the, the youth wing of the kind of, like, professional class who are, these overproduced elite aspirants, you know, um, and that a lot of their kind of crazy ideology comes from their, from their class role, basically. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, but it's important to remember, like, um, you know, there's an awful lot of people from, from, a, from a kind of Peter Hitchens to like the neocons or whatever, who did this right, left or left, right move throughout their life. But, you know, back in, just a few years ago, like around 2016, 2017, you know, a magazine like Jacobin was actually, I felt very much at home there because they started out kind of publishing things that were actually quite critical of um, progressive neoliberalism or, or something like that. So I kind of liked, I, I really felt at home there because of that, that critique. It, I often use as an example, they started off with a, an interview with Walter Ben Michaels um, who wrote the trouble with diversity? So, uh, so it really is a case of of everyone else changed and I didn't, you know. 
It, it, so the, you have, I guess it would have been, what was that, 2017, where you sort of parted brass regs with, uh, with the left? No, the, it, was, it, was, it was 2018, kind of okay. late in 2018. So I held on like beyond a point where I, I knew the, thing, the whole thing was getting quite ridiculous. But, um, you know, because I, I kind of had always had this problem with the left. Like I always felt that a lot of the, its economic projects were absolutely necessary and I still do. Um, but I simply couldn't accept um, uh, much of its cultural projects. And um, yeah, and I, I did think that 2016 kind of opened up the possibility for real, a realignment um, that, that would be something closer to what I had always wanted it to be, you know. Um, but then it just went wildly off in the wrong direction. Uh, and it became this, um, this, you know, the, the cultural politics kind of came to dominate to a point where, you know, I had to think like, this is just so profoundly socially destructive and, um, antisocial and almost like anti, anti-civilizational at a certain point, um, but also, I mean, one thing that's, uh, sorry, this is a bit of a long answer, but one thing that has always kind of um, been a problem for me with the, the thing that we call the left is that you can kind of broadly define it as a, a, it always has some kind of egalitarian economic project and either a liberationist cultural project or one that you might say is trying to um, liberate people from the shackles of tradition in some way. So that would be true of even the Soviet Union, which, you know, is obviously you couldn't describe as libertarian or something culturally libertarian, like, like you can the post-Cold War American left. But they all kind of have those two things in common, I think. That's like the common thread. Um, but in fact, those two things um, don't have any necessary connection whatsoever, really. Um, there's no reason why a person has to um, have libertarian or liberationist cultural politics to believe in economic justice or equality. Yeah, the um, no, I, I, I'm going to say something, but I want to define a term before I say it, which is so in the American context, you know, when we talk about uh, class. I will a lot of times just use middle class for a very broadly. So it's sort of because I think that's the American conception, which it sort of encompasses the working class um, uh, as well. So what I'm about to say, sort of, just know that's the way I'm thinking about it. But mm. the way I've thought about the uh, an appropriate um, set of economic policies is predicated upon the fact that a the 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 state or the government has. Um, an outsized obligation to its own citizens versus non-citizens. That's number one. And that the American, the, the most valuable asset that the American middle class has is its monopoly access or its asymmetric access to the U.S. labor market. And so to the extent that um, uh, large corporations in partnership with the state um, fail to control borders. It's a form of uh, uh, it's a form of economic warfare on the middle class, which de- which uh, which impoverishes the middle class because it brings in labor competition that they would not otherwise have had. And as a result, you get median wages stagnate or decline. And as a result, it's harder to form families, buy houses, have kids, all just the normal features of life. Yeah. Mm. Does that seem? I mean, does does that sound outlandish and outlandish to you? Because um, there are elements of the sort of the libertarian right that would grow hives if I if they heard me say that. <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting that you mentioned the libertarian right because one of the things that is sort of opaque about the left and and sort of a recurring problem for the right in general, I would say, is that. The right, when it tries to understand the left, focuses not on what these people actually do, but on what they say. And uh, that's where you get a lot of this, like, oh, these Marxists, they want a proletarian revolution, kind of, you know, like, almost like we're still in the Cold War or something. But the thing that you can 
notice if you follow along like channels and tunnel to the left is just how like libertarians or libertarian ideology, anarchist ideology, it's it's completely dominant on the left today. Um, Malcolm, maybe you can um, sort of do what uh, Angela did, which is uh, you grew up um, in basically the Swedish leftist youth movement. Um, and then you had a similar, I guess, uh, road to Damascus moment where you became a non-denominational populist, which is a phrase I'm I may steal from you, but I'll give you credit three times because a friend told me you have to give credit three times on these phrases yeah. and then you're free to use it yourself. Yeah, I, I, I heartily um, endorse your attempts to steal that because I think it's a pretty good phrase in our time. Um, uh, this is this is the time to be sort of a non-denominational populist and not hold fast to a lot of like outdated doctrine but but yeah sure like the the short version of 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 my story is essentially that i joined the uh, like the left party in 2010 or thereabouts i mean like i had been sort of a not terribly interested in politics sort of social democrat before then and then you know i got radicalized into like the necessity of proletarian revolution or whatever. And, uh, you know, you join the left and the left has this sort of internal culture where, like, you are part of the vanguard, you are part of the chosen uh, sort of advance intellectual caste that will lead the people into, like, the promised land, essentially. And I believed in that, and I didn't leave voluntarily. In fact, I got cancelled, kicked out, much the same way Angela did. But while Angela sort of took a stand for something that was, like, obviously controversial at that point, I just made the mistake of writing an analysis of why the left party didn't do that well among immigrant voters in Sweden, because part of the sweet, like the left sort of self image here is that, of course, we represent immigrants and, you know, women and everyone that's uh, a marginalized group, like all of them understand that the left is their movement. And that's why they support us and vote for us. But in practice, immigrants didn't generally vote for the left party and the Sweden Democrats, the uh, party that supposedly wanted to, you know, like gas all the immigrants in giant death camps or whatever, like they actually were very competitive among immigrants. So I tried to explain that using a sort of like materialist analysis. And that just ruffled the wrong feathers at the wrong time, essentially. Like if I had written that essay, eight months later, it wouldn't have been controversial at all. But ultimately, what, what gets you sort of kicked out in the left, and, and I will return to this point several times during this conversation, I think, but like the left is not about ideas. Ideas are not the driving force. Sure, people can say, oh yeah, I'm a Marxist-Leninist, I'm a blah, 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 but very little of that actually matters. Um, instead, what sort of paints a target on your back is usually just your willingness to go against consensus. Like even if you go against consensus and people sort of react to that and you can prove that you were in the right, like your argument had merit, it was correct or whatever. Like even if Marx himself rose from the grave and said, oh, you know, Malcolm <laughs> actually, like, I agree with him. On this. Like, you, you should chill out. Like, yeah, sure, people would be really uh, courteous while Marx walked the earth. But when he returned to heaven or hell or wherever he rests now, everyone